we want to go now and look. One of the promises of God is in Isaiah 54. And one of the things that the enemy does to any person is try to discourage and bring people down. And the way to do that is to misrepresent the nature of God. And if you misrepresent the nature of God and the way you come into life, then you get discouraged. And so what the enemy does, um, and we're fighting a spiritual warfare, which is between your ears, is he always tries to get your mind to think negatively. And he undermines what God is really like and the nature of God and the ways of God. And so we want to look in Isaiah uh, 54. And in verse 1, it says this, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, said the Lord. Um, and one of the things is the contrast God has between uh, what would appear natural and that which is God's purpose. And it goes on, enlarge the place of thy tent and stretch, let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords and, length, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded. For thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. And here we get uh, the Lord speaking through the prophet Isaiah. And he's saying, look, first of all, uh, when you look at the natural, uh, it can be discouraging. And so he says, look, even though you're... Um, in widowhood, the desolate shall have more children than the married woman. And, and it's pointing out that, and we're talking about the church of Jesus Christ, because the mother of us all is New Jerusalem. And we're coming into a church age, and so that's why we inherit, um, and he makes it very plain in verse... Um, um, where is it? Uh, verse 3. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. One of the things is, in the time of the Gentiles, everything comes good. And, and it's not that I want to talk about it. It's the promises that come afterwards. He says, fear not for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, thou shalt not be put to shame. One of the things that the enemy of our souls always works on is condemnation. And condemnation is one of the curses of the church because people are condemned not by God but by their conscience and by other Christians and by the world and by people. And normally, they want to bring people down with shame. Uh, one of the things I noticed in the Olympics was some of the people were, when, when they failed to achieve the ultimate, they felt ashamed. You know, people had put so much effort into it, and they were so determined that they felt that being second or third was a shame. But when you're competing against the whole world, then you've got to look at it, hey, you might not be the very top, but you got to a world finals. You got to um, thank God for the number of gold medals we won. Um, it was nice to see um, Britain do so well. Um, but one of the things that is so clear is shame. And one of the things the enemy always works in a person's heart is to feel that you didn't accomplish what you could have accomplished. 
Well, the truth is no one ever accomplishes everything they could accomplish because all of us are flesh and blood, skin and bone. And <coughs> you cannot possibly accomplish some of the things you'd really like to. Um, and it's just part of life. Uh, there are things you see. And the devil works on our envy and jealousy. And we compare ourselves with each other. And Paul writes and he says, look, don't compare yourselves one with another. Um, once you do that and you start doing that, shame comes and guilt and condemnation. And God doesn't ever want us to be condemned. He always wants to lift us up. And the prophet then goes on. He said, For thy maker, verse 5, is thy husband, and the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. And um, I love it because... It makes it so clear it's God who's our true husband. And our part in life is to be, God does everything for us, and our part is to live for him. And then he goes on. Uh, for the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment... Have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah shall no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. Now, when you start looking at it, God's saying to the Gentiles, hey, uh, I want to give you a comparison so you understand. Uh, God says, I, I get angry. Um, and I got angry with the Son of Man because he was exceedingly wicked. And he wiped out all but Noah's family. Now, he says, I'll never do that again. And he says, look, I forsook you for a small moment, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. Now, God has promised right from the day of Noah that he will never, ever be wroth with his children, nor rebuke them. Now, that is a promise. And you, you can see it every time it rains. There's a rainbow which sets the covenant that God made. God won't forsake his children. He says, I will never forsake you nor leave you. Now, in the olden days, um, before Noah's time, God poured the flood out and destroyed every living thing. But now, he says, no, I'll never do it again. And he leaves the covenant, and the covenant of Noah is blessed by the rainbow. You'll always see the rainbow. And one of the things when you have a vision of heaven, you will always see surrounding the throne is the rainbow around God's throne. And, and it's so important to understand that God has made a covenant with man. So I'll never do it again. I did it for a time. I'll never do it again. So when you get the book of Job, you'll find that it was the enemy who came along and said, look, let me test Job. Uh, Satan was under the control of God. It wasn't God who was angry with Job. It was the devil who wanted to destroy it because all the time there's only one in creation who wants to kill, steal, and destroy, and that is the devil. And so it's never God. 
God will only do things for our benefit. He will never do things against us. Our God is a God of love. And he, the prophet realized that God had made a covenant. He would not ever forsake us nor abandon us. Now, what happens is because of the bad preaching, a lot of people feel that if something goes wrong, God's against them. They've made a mistake, so God's against them. That is not true. That's a lie of the devil. Because the word of God makes it plain, he won't ever do that. Um, just remember the rainbow any time you feel that way. Hey, the covenant of Noah still applies. And if it didn't apply, the rainbow would no more appear. But it always applies. God will never sweep away any person. So what we're tested with, and the strongholds of Satan are in the mind, in the reasonings and imaginations, what we're tested with, we're tested by the enemy of our souls. When Jesus Christ came to earth, and the Lord sent the Holy Spirit down in the form of a dove, and it rested upon him, and then the Spirit led him into the wilderness, but it wasn't God who tempted him, because God will never tempt man with sin. It was a devil. A devil came and appeared. And we need to understand that we, we are never, ever, uh, tempted of God, nor are we uh, cast off from God, nor are we forsaken, forsaken of God. But at times, God will allow us to go through trials. But the trials are because the enemy of our souls seeks to try us. It's not God. The devil is a servant of God. That's it. And he's restricted. God will not let him go to touch your life. Jesus Christ has come to give us life and life more abundant. And, and he makes it plain when he came to God and said, let me test Job. He said, you can go so far, but don't you touch his life. In other words, God drew the boundaries and said, devil, you don't go beyond this. And the moment he overcame the tests and the moment the tests were over, God gave him double portion of everything. And you'll see this from the scriptures. It's a promise of God. It's one of the most precious things. Um, we tend to think if we do something wrong, then God is a vindictive God. Because people have had that notion. Um, and people, preachers preach, you know, a sinner in the hands of an angry God. And, you know, they think God's angry. But if you're a child of God, you've been born again. God has spoken life into you. God will never forsake you. God will never leave you. And his loving kindness will always be upon you, no matter what. Is that plain? Um, and, and once you get out of that, you've lost sight of what salvation is. He goes on uh, and he says, 4, verse 10, The mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but... My kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on me. Now, that is as plain as you can get it. I mean, it's so plain. You can't fail to understand it. Is that clear? Okay. If the mountains are removed and the hills removed, my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed. Now, what is the covenant of his peace? Well, when we're born again, we get the peace of God that passeth all understanding. That peace will never be taken from us. Now, that is one of the things that I discover. Uh, some Christians, so-called, um, who claim to have an experience of God, say, well, if it's God's will, I get a deep peace within. That is not God. The peace comes from faith. It doesn't come from feeling. And the peace we have is based on the faith we have in God's word. Because faith comes by hearing the word of God. I believe, therefore I know. And I believe what? I believe his word. 
I don't believe a feeling, I don't believe a vision, I don't believe a dream, I believe God's word. Uh, and I never ever want to go out. My dear friend Oral Roberts said, never follow a vision, never follow a dream. Do what God tells you to do. And that is the basis of our faith, always. And so when we look at it here, we realize, hey, that, that is the way it is. The covenant of my peace um, won't be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. And then he goes on, and this is interesting. He says, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colours, and lay thy foundations with sapphires, and I will make thy windows of agates, and thy gates of carbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stones, and all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great uh, shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. And, and, and the thing that oppresses a person is when you fear what's going to happen. You know, my Bible says that fear has torment, and, and there's nothing worse than the enemy of our souls always wants us to feel that somehow God is against us. If he can convince us that God is against us, then actually we make God into the devil. Or we make the devil into God, should I say, whichever way you want to put it. Um, we put the attributes of the enemy onto God, and God said, no, my loving kindness is never going to depart from you. I'm never going to forsake you. I've made a covenant with you. And that covenant is for everlasting. There's nothing ever is going to separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Neither things present nor things to come, it says in Romans. Neither life nor death can separate us from the love of God. You can't be separated. Once you're a born again son of God, there is no separation. Now, one of the things that happens is people are told, oh, well, you can lose your salvation. Impossible. If you're born a son and you come into sonship and you're truly born again, you can't get deborn. Um, you can't. You know, God doesn't do that. Once you're born, you're born. And God's loving kindness will never depart from you. You're his child. Doesn't matter if you go off into a far country, the moment you come to yourself and realize what a fool you are, you'll find he still owns you as his son and he still gives you the very best of everything because his loving kindness cannot depart from you. Now, when you get that understanding inside of the love of God and a realization of how much God loves you, then it changes your perspective and your mind and you're at peace. It doesn't matter what's happening. So here he's talking about, if you look at it, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colours. Hey, you go through trials, there will be opposition in life. The devil's out there, and those that are under the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience, are going to do everything to destroy you. But what you've got to understand is, even while they're trying that, all they're doing is putting pressure on, and God says, every trial you go through is more precious than fine gold. And he says, I'll lay everything about you with precious stones, with jewels. Better than a gold medal. <laughs> this is eternal. And it's a promise of God. God is putting you through trials, and you will be perfected by him. And he allows those trials, but God is not administering them. It's the enemy of our souls. When Paul was beaten and put in prison, it wasn't God who did it, it was the devil. And, and it was the people who were inspired of the devil. When religious people go at you, it's the devil's work. It's not God's. And, and we somehow are 
being tricked sometimes to think, ah, oh, must be God. If we're ill, why has God allowed this? I don't know. I don't know why God heals some and not others. I don't know why people go through trials and not others. I don't have answers because God's ways are past finding out and if I did find out, then I'd be God and I'm not. Um, but I do know when he tells me, I know. But if he doesn't tell me, I just say, I don't know. There's nothing wrong with not knowing. I don't understand why God allowed Job to go through all the trials he went through. I don't understand why I see some people who really are genuine uh, go through real trials in life and then there's some ripe pigs that live next door and nothing seems to happen to them. Everything seems to go well. And you think, Lord, you know, and King David in the Psalms said, your ways aren't equal. You know, how is it the people that are right seem to get the trials and the people that are wrong get away with it? Well, they only get away with it for a time because they're all going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and some are going to stand before the great white throne and then they'll have no excuse. Now, we have passed from death to life and the only thing we would stand before the judgment seat of Christ for is to receive rewards. That's all. There's no judgment. Judgment passed. And we were brought into the kingdom of God and, and Jesus Christ paid the price for your sin and my sin. From the day of your birth to the day you depart this life, his blood will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that's it. It's a done deal. And when you're born from above, old things are passed away. That means you don't have a past. You have a present and you have a future. But you don't have a past. And every day, you don't have a past. So there, you can never go back, oh, you know, I regret this, I regret that. Well, you, you might regret it, but it doesn't, the shame has gone. What you did, you did. Finish. God doesn't remember it. He says, your sin, he'll divide from you as far as the east is from the west and remember it no more. Now, if God's not remembering it, you have no business to remember it. And, and what the enemy does, he has um, one of these video uh, DVDs, you know, and, and he plays it to you. It's called All Our Yesterdays. And you start, thinking, and suddenly it comes into your mind, Oh, I remember when I was 20, I did this. What a fool. Um, when I was 15, I did that. Uh, and he'll come back and he'll, he'll throw it into your mind and then start accusing you of it. But Jesus Christ wiped it out. And the moment you start going back, it says you forget those things that are behind. And if you forget them and you don't allow the enemy to get you to start thinking about them, because the one thing he does, he starts playing the tape of your yesterdays. And then he gets you feeling guilty about it. And then you get some nincompoop comes along and says, oh, well, you know, you need to repent of it. You need to get that right. No, you don't. It's gone forever. Is that plain? Hello? Now, once you get that into your heart, then you can believe God's word. He goes on. And he says this, um, in righteousness, verse 14, shalt thou be established, and thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Now do understand all opposition doesn't come from God. When people come to oppose you, it's not God. They are not part of God's kingdom. If they were part of God's kingdom, they couldn't do it. The thing that shows that they're false is the fact that they gather together against the people of God. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. And God says, hey, 
they might gather together, but they're going to fall. And God's going to make sure they fall. And he says, I'm, I'm going to cause them to fall for thy sake. And then he explains it. Behold, I've created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. Uh, there's two things you've got to understand. God created Satan. God created the waster. God created the instruments he uses. But God says they're going to be useless against you. There's no way they're ever going to win. The only thing that's going to happen when you go through the tempest, when you go through the flood, when you go through the fire, when you go through the um, storm, it's going to just make you more precious and God is going to adorn your life with precious things. That's all. Never to destroy. And he, he makes it quite plain. He says, look, behold, verse 15, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals. But because he created it doesn't mean he's involved in what they do. Uh, he's not. He allows them to do it, but he's not involved. And he says, anyone that gathers together against you, it's not God who's doing it. So don't ever feel when uh, opposition comes, when people persecute you, don't feel that somehow you must have upset God. No, you haven't. No one that ever comes against you is sent against you by God. They're sent against you by the devil. And the spirit that works in them is a spirit that works in the children of disobedience. And you don't need to worry about it. Uh, when people come and they want to overwhelm you with their lies and, and accusations, you can ignore it. God didn't send them. The devil did. And the devil comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Now, you'll always know if someone's coming to destroy someone, hey, they're doing the devil's work. They're not doing God's work. Anyone that gathers together to go against you, that's not God. Never can be. So don't think that they're doing God's work. They're not. And God says it very plainly. The prophet makes it plain. Hey, this isn't by me that this is happening. This is the enemy of your soul. And in your mind, you've got to get it clear who's operating. So when someone comes, um, people have come to me and said stupid things uh, and tried to convince me of this or that. I, look, I'm not going to be terrified. I'm never going to have that because it's not meant to come near me. If people want to come and warn me, oh, be careful of this, be careful of that, I listen to them and think, yeah, well, shows where you are. I'm not worried about anything because in the end, only the people who gather against us are sent to the devil. And God says, I'll fix them good. And I like that. I like God's fixing. Uh, I would like to help him speed it up. Um, I would like to suggest I could, you know, help him. But it'll... Um, Always work. Look at verse 14. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Now it's in his righteousness, not ours. Far from oppression, no fear, no terror. It's not going to come near us. But it's amazing how many people uh, come along and they say, oh, you know, this will happen or that will happen. Have, you know, when, when you look at things in life, uh, people can... Uh, and the devil will come and he'll suggest to your mind all kinds of calamities. And, oh, you know, if this happens, or if that happens, or if someone does this, or someone does that, or the economy is going to crack, or this is going to happen. And the truth is that you can live and worry about things that never happen. And if you go back in your life, how many times have you been threatened with things? And helpful people have come along and done the devil's work and fed it into your mind because that's their thick heads. Um, but the truth is, God loves you 
and his loving kindness is upon you and nothing's going to go wrong. But you can imagine 50 plagues will meet your house. You can imagine this this will fail, that'll fail. And people that live with that fear and torment are really giving place to the devil. And it says, give no place to the devil. I, I don't want to let the devil have his place in my life. And nor should you. You know, it, it just is wrong. Well, I had a heart attack. In fact, my heart stopped four times. Well, but it started again. I'm still alive. Now, was it God? No, it was the enemy trying to steal my life. I've got something God wanted me to do or I wouldn't be here anymore. The devil doesn't control death. The devil doesn't hold the keys of death now. Jesus Christ does. And, and the fact is, Jesus Christ is the author of life. He came to give me life and life more abundant. And I'm not going to live my life in fear and terror. I, plenty of people, oh, you know, if you did this, you did that. Look, everyone in life makes mistakes. But the truth is, the devil doesn't have a chance. Okay? God says, hey, they're going to be finished. And then verse 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Then it goes on. Now, if you've got that right in your life, then you can go on with verse 1 of Isaiah 55, uh, the realization. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, Come ye to the waters, uh, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy, eat, yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. And it doesn't say unfermented wine. Um, it says come and buy wine and milk. And, and, you know, if it was proper milk, the living milk, not, not the stuff we get in the shops now from the supermarket, it, it's good for you. You know, God said, you're going into a land flowing with milk and honey. Um, but you don't want milk that man's fiddled with. You want the proper milk. And he says, you can come and buy. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel for he hath glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he was near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Now here you go back. You know, the wicked have got to forsake their way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And the thing that makes us unrighteous means we're not right with God. That's what unrighteousness means. And Basically, you're not right with God when you think wrongly. And the worst thing is to think that God doesn't love you. First love is a revelation. I love God because he first loved me. And first love is God's love for me. And, and the thing that is the trick of the enemy is to get you to concentrate on how much you love God that's not an issue. The real issue is this, the revelation of how much God loves me. And once you get that right, and you realize it's the loving kindness of God, God will never forsake me, God will never leave me, God will never desert me, God cannot do it, God has made a covenant that he won't do it, God has put a rainbow in the skies to tell me that it's an everlasting covenant, 
He's even put it in eternity because the rainbow is round the throne of God in the heavens. So don't tell me that it's going to go. It can never go. It's eternal. The covenant God made is eternal. And he says, look, I'll never be against you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never leave you. My loving kindness is always toward you. My tender mercies are always toward you. And, and when you get a comprehension of the love of God for you, and you realize that is first love. Now you love him because he first loved you. And when you realize that, and you get off the idea of what you have to do, and you get onto the idea and revelation of what God has done for you, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's how much he loves you. He gave the life of his son for you and for me. Uh, the whole revelation comes back to that. And then we, we stop the bad imaginations and we stop the bad thinking and we become positive. When things go wrong and oppressions come and the enemy tries to get at you, no oppression can touch you because you know God loves you. Hey, God's not going to forsake me. God's not doesn't matter what happens in life I know my God and in the end all things are going to work together for good to those who love God to those who are the called according to his purposes I love him because he first loved me I know he can never leave me he'll never forsake me he'll never abandon me and it's not based on what I do it's based on what he has done for me by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. God gifted me into life, and it was a free gift. I did nothing for it. I didn't deserve it, and I would suggest neither did you. But when God saves you, when God births you, it's all his love, his kindness, his mercy, his grace. And, and once you get hold of that, you begin to understand. Isaiah was trying to get the people to understand the nature of God. God's view of things. And the children of Israel had a problem. They could never grasp how much God loved them. They saw it when, the, when God came down on the mountaintop. Uh, they exceedingly quaked. God said, look, I want to be your God. I want to dwell among you. And they said, no, 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 you've got it wrong. Don't you speak to us. You speak to Moses and let him tell us. And so they rejected a relationship with God and they based it all on their stupidity. And, and what we have to understand is, hey, God wants to speak to us, know us. That's why he says, all shall know me from the least to the greatest. How? Because... God wants relationship with man. God wants to tabernacle with man. God wants to live in you. He wants to live in me. And that's what he does when I'm born again. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And the whole thing comes back to a revelation of God's love for us. And the whole thing in the devil's work is to try and convince us that God is against us. And so when things get difficult in life, Oh, Lord, where are you? When you get, oh, Lord. And we go with the wrong attitude. If you come with the attitude of, hey, God loves me, and you start from that basis, then you have faith. But when you start from fear, you have no faith. And fear is the opposite of faith. They both begin with F, but one is not very pleasant. Fear's got torment. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? How does God let this happen? How does God let those things happen? And then you start, and it's a treadmill. You can never really figure out what is going on. And all I would say to you is God is a God of love. His loving kindness will never leave you. Yeah. We all go through trials. We all go through temptations. We all go through difficulties. But we have a God who cares. We have a God who loves. We have a God who's merciful. And we need to understand that. 
And that's the whole purpose of Isaiah, to come and say, hey, look, we can drink freely of the river of life. It's a gift from God. And each one of us needs to grasp the truth. God loves me. His love will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He cannot abandon me because I'm a child of his. I belong to him. Amen? Is that plain? So everything that comes in life is but a trial to give you more precious stones, more precious jewels, more precious gold. It's called a trial of your faith. And so all the devil's doing is actually God's work in perfecting you. But anyone that gathers together against you, God doesn't do it. They do it in spite of the enemy. And may the Lord reward them in eternity for all they've done. Because he will. There'll come a day when they'll answer. Amen? But for you, it's different. Let's pray. Father, I just pray for each one here. Lord, let us understand your loving kindness, your mercy, your grace. Lord, I thank you for the covenant promise that we'll have the peace of God that passeth understanding. Lord, I thank you you promised you'd never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, that the terrors of night would never come to us. Lord, that you will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Lord, we believe in your love. It's your love that heals. It's your love that delivers. It's your love that breaks the chains. Lord, keep each one and let the word of life get hold of each one, I pray. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.